the guide wire and then you'll have the tube now i'm probably wrong about this stuff because i'm just saying it from memory but please correct me if i'm wrong once that happens and eat um as, don't forget to make sure that the machine is usually under observation in the ICU um, more than likely they're hemodynamically unstable so that means you're watching their blood pressure but also those EKG leads have a respiratory lead so that you can also see how fast they're breathing um, this is very useful if the patient is not um, if you can't sit one-to-one -one with the patient, you need to go take care of a number ICU patient or two and you can't stay in the room with them the whole time. And then when they become, you know, if they have trouble with breathing and they come into respiratory failure, then of course um, the major thing is that you really don't want them to, to lose consciousness because then that becomes a whole slew of neurologic problems and trouble. If you, oh, sorry buddy. Um, but uh, you want to get that tube in when their respiration rate is like 30s, 40s, and you know that they're having trouble. But definitely before they fall unconscious. And even then, you want to check their neuro and cardiac status to make sure they're not in full, co full on cardiac arrest. Uh, you want also want to make sure it's just respiratory. And it's just a respiratory problem. Call the anesthesia department. We are going to notify the anesthesiologist and the CRNA, and they're going to get ready and they're going to come up to your department and assess the patient. You better be ready with the patient's labs and assist them to see if there's any problems. I am sorry, assist them with the report, a nursing report, um, and let them know exactly what's causing. The respiratory distress. Now, anesthesia is just going to care about why the patient's in respiratory distress, and you're going to tell them. And then maybe they'll want to know if there's any allergies or <coughs> any problems with the airway. Of course, we want them to know as well. Don't go there too far there. Next, the attending physician will probably come in too and want to see why the patient is being prepared to be intubated. Most most likely, you're the first person that plans out and requests the intubation, and the attending physician. We'll probably agree with you. I mean, who's, who's going to say no to intubating a patient unless the patient is really, really old or hanging by a string, which also you don't want to recommend an intubation if the patient is not that stable. Because if you intubate them, will they really get out of it? That's a big question right now. During COVID. Will they get out of intubation? Even if you save their life, will they be able to live their life without that tube in their throat? Once that happens, you need to make sure that you yeah, accommodate and succinyl, succinyl colonase ready because you want to be able to paralyze, paralyze the patient and also keep, keep them... Hey! Oh, gross. <laughs> it's good that you like to wear a mask and get mask trash. You want to paralyze the patient. And then, of course, the first person that you sit, you call before you can call the attending and anesthesia is a respiratory therapist because anesthesia can't start without a respiratory therapist on board they're going to want to um, bag the patient because you have to take them out of by probably the BiPAP machine or the AIRVO or high flow nasal cannula they're probably on prior to being intubated and then after that let me throw this mask away so after that, the respiratory therapist will get the machine ready because you can't intubate and then not have the ventilator ready. You have to have it next to you. 
So they'll get the ventilator in, they'll call their teammates to get the ventilator machine ready, and then he or she, the respiratory therapist, will disconnect the patient from the mask or the high flow nasal cannula. And then when the machine is ready, the anesthesiologist or the CRNA will have a glide scope, which is an electronic viewfinder. I don't know how really to describe it. It looks like a little black Game Boy. <laughs> <laughs> that lets you see oh my god what are you doing for me? that lets you be able to see into the trachea past the vocal cords where they want to put the, the um, trach tube ETT which is called a endotracheal tube abbreviation into the trachea and not into the stomach so once they slide that thing in they're going to use a stylet to be able to bring it all the way through and then they'll retract the catheter or the guide wire and then you'll have the tube now I'm probably wrong about this stuff because I'm just saying it from memory but please correct me if I'm wrong once that happens and eat um, as, don't forget to make sure that the machine for the co2 detector is available because what they're gonna look for is a rise and fall of a uh, of the chest to make sure that the air is actually transferring in and out of the patient's trachea but the gold standard besides uh, more than even more so than chest x-ray at this time is that there should be co2 coming out so they need a co2 detector to be able to confirm whether or not that trachea is in. they will not leave until that co2 is in at this time you've already put in the the crna and that, or you have already pushed in the paralytics and the um, barbiturates which is a sucks and accommodate <coughs> or rock which is rock your own be careful with what medications you give i know the adrenaline is running high but you don't want to kill the patient and give the wrong thing okay after that uh they'll probably want to put in <coughs> the anesthesiologist might want to put in <coughs> a central line which is uh, uh which will give you access directly into the heart of the patient so you can give medications that are very vasoactive <coughs> and you will also have different catheters um, so you don't have to worry about putting in an IV on a patient it's probably a very very hard stick by now so um, you'll be able to work with central lines rather than just peripheral intravenous veins uh, intravenous catheters next which is just your regular nursing IVs next after that you're going to want to also make sure that maybe the CRNA can install an arterial line for you because most of these patients are very hemodynamically unstable and because of that they need to have a radial arterial line which is a catheter similar to what looks like an IV but they've got a transducer which is um, which is a, a little detector that will give you live blood pressure which is indispensable to a critical care nurse this means that you get real-time blood pressures on your patient not ones that you take through a cuff in the arm every five minutes hey don't eat poop every five minutes or so um, because you want to know if the patient um, blood pressure is starting to fall um, in that case you'll have to increase your uh, vasopressors uh, usually we start with levo but in this hospital we start with neo I'll have to look into that and find out why anyway at this time the patient your crna and anesthesiologist has put in your treat your endotracheal tube and your vasopress i mean sorry in your central line and your crna also put in your arterial line if they didn't also put in the endotracheal tube um, hey remy calm down calm down After that, uh, I have to put in a video about how to install arterial lines. There are quite a few good ones, but there's, they're not close, close up. So I want to make an arterial line video about how to set it up <coughs> close up. I don't mean to do that. And then, so you've got your blood pressure medications. And you also want to make sure the patient's sedated. Oh, oh, preparing the patient is also difficult because you also have to make sure that you have the orders for the ventilator. Usually the RT will get this 
Well, they need to be able to have the doctor's orders to put in for the ventilators. So they want to know the respiratory rate, the FiO2, the tidal volume, which is based on the patient's ideal weight. So you'll also need to know the patient's height at this time, height and weight. And um, oh, the peep. Usually the peeps are high for COVID patients between 12 and 20 centimeters of water. Uh, then you want to make sure that you get uh, OGT before you get the x-ray to come in to verify the, the placement of the tracheal tube. I know they, they verified it with a ET with a CO2, but you also want to verify with the um, chest x-ray. But before they do that, I want to go ahead and insert the OGT, which is the oral gastric tube or the nasogastric tube, but prefer the OGT into the patient before they take the x-ray so they can verify everything all, everything all at once. After that, you also want to put in a Foley catheter because this patient will probably most likely be incontinent of urine. But not only that, is that because if this patient has a respiratory problem, most likely they might have a cardio, cardiac problem. They might not have the greatest output, specifically if they have low blood pressure. They'll probably be oliguric, so you'll want to know when that pee is coming in or if it doesn't come in at all. Now, you'll get a blood test results to make sure that you're keeping a try an eye on this oh don't forget that the rt at this time should be getting an arterial blood gas um, to make sure that they get a baseline so that they can re-follow it up after they intubate the patient at the same time you will also be getting um, labs on the patient to see how their blood is doing and also how their kidney functions liver functions all that stuff is known as well so it's really a whole big thing and Basically, if you're going to intubate a patient, it's going to be a whole production. So be ready for a busy night. All right, I probably missed a lot of stuff there, but um, uh, head on over to my website and I'll try to put in some notes if I miss anything. And if, if I did, and if you have any recommendations, please, please, please uh, write it in the comments below. Like and subscribe, let me know. Okay, bye.